Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, a philanthropic community partner since 1922, and a proud supporter of numerous community organizations. More information at smithville.com. The Al Cobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Al Cobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. Tonight, take a journey through Indiana's history and see how surprising events shaped our communities. Discover how two Bloomington men rebuilt a legacy in their own garage. Learn how the University of Notre Dame took on the Klan in a battle for their community. Celebrate a visit from the circus in a turn of the century town. And welcome the Bloomington band Stay Outside, inside for a studio performance. Explore the unexpected corners of Indiana history right now on the weekly special. Welcome to the weekly special. I'm Erica Sagone. We start our journey into Indiana history tonight in our own backyard, or rather our street. In 1896, if you wanted a horseless carriage, you had to pretty much build it yourself. And that is just what one Bloomington man did. My first experience with this car was in the early 70s. I was in the Cub Scouts. And our Cub Scout master took us to the museum that used to be in the old student building at IU. And this car was on display there. And I remember we all gathered around it. That's a car? You know, somebody actually went somewhere with that? It always fascinated me because it was the first car in Bloomington. At that time, I had no idea how on earth the thing could possibly work and what did it actually do? What am I looking at? This car, the first car to drive the streets of Bloomington in 1897 was built by jeweler and real estate mogul J.O. Howe. Howe, also an engineer for Bloomington's all-volunteer fire department, was mechanically inclined, a tinkerer by nature. But how and why that translates into building a car from scratch is anybody's guess. He did travel quite a bit. And one of the family reminiscences said that he had traveled out east, he'd seen some of the new horseless carriages, we don't know what he saw, he made some sketches, came home and, and started building. And on June 25th, 1897, about eight months after construction began, Howe tested his car for the first time. The newspaper claimed it worked surprisingly well because he drove it from his store on the west side of the square all the way to 2nd Street, going down College Avenue. We've never gotten this one to go more than maybe 100 feet before there's some kind of major failure. So we're kind of in awe that that first trip, of course, he was going a little bit downhill. I was going to say, we haven't tried it on our downhill yet. Yeah. Maybe we should per perhaps go that direction. Yeah, and there's a little too much traffic to, <laughs> to actually duplicate his route right now. That's right, a duplicate. Because a few years ago, more than a century after Howe's trip south from the square, and nearly a half century after a young Cub Scout first laid eyes on this mesmerizing machine, Carl received a challenge from the director of Bloomington's Stone Age Institute. Nick Toth, he said to me, what do you think it would take to get this car running again? And I said, well, you won't even let us touch it without white gloves. That's impossible. But it might be kind of fun to build a replica. Almost immediately, Carl brought in friend, colleague, and fellow car buff Ronan Young. And together, they began to research what it might take. It's just a little carriage. How hard could it be? It's just a few parts. It's an engine and a frame and a little drivetrain. It can't be any big deal. And uh, it snowballed from there. It snowballed, in part because Carl and Ronan wanted their car to be as close a match to Howe's as possible. We wanted an exact replica because we wanted to see 
really what the original car was. What could it do? What did it sound like? What did it run like? And we wanted to make an absolutely exact copy that we could play with. You have to remember that nobody alive had ever heard that original car run. We probably made it a bigger deal than we needed to because we decided to do everything from scratch. Flywheels were cast at Salisbury's Sculpture Trails foundry. Frame members were sourced from centuries-old oak beams, and rough parts were fine-tuned by machinist Dennis Maddox. The simple, very simple engine has approximately 150 parts. We had to make every single one of those, every nut, bolt, and screw on that engine. And after countless hours of work, the Howe car, version 2.0, was ready for its own first drive. The end of September of 2016, we had the car in its near final configuration. We had it pushed out and we were ready to try and run it. And we had been pulling on it for hours, it felt like. And it would pop here and there. It would occasionally pop, but when it would pop, we'd get excited because now we knew something was going to happen. We were going to make this run. If we could get it to pop, we knew we could get it to run. And then it popped, it ran a couple of revolutions, and it backfired and broke the crankshaft two weeks from our uh, big uh, yeah. debut. Yeah. Despite the broken parts and the looming deadline, the team was thrilled. There were a lot of cheers and high fives going around yeah. after that. Yeah, we were pretty excited because it was really that culmination of a lot of hard work. But there was more hard work to be done. Crankshaft quality control was just one of the issues. It started on fire every time we started it on acetylene. When you were running it, it'd start on fire, and it'd backfire and start on fire. Including one particularly dramatic example in Newport, Indiana, with Carl, who remained remarkably calm in the driver's seat. Well, I, I, I wasn't feeling the fire. He I, wasn't I, the one I back there pulling the flywheels trying to suck yeah, the fire back I, I, in. I was, uh, you know, I, I didn't see any pressing need to leave at that point. I thought maybe because he was pulling on it, I thought the thing might start up and then I was going to need to drive it. The risk of explosion was pretty low, I think. But just high enough that a change was in order. Additional research led the team to believe that coal gas, commonly available at the time, was a likely fuel for Howe. And it's a very close chemical relative of propane. So the car today, we run on propane. We tested it on acetylene and quickly uh, abandon that for yeah, a whole bunch of reasons. We proved we could run it on acetylene. We, we could actually toyed with the idea of building our own acetylene generator to. But when you work through it, the gas. number of bad ideas that accumulate when you do that. Um, yeah, we were, we were starting we, to rationalize some pretty bad ideas yeah, there so. at some point. That's why we switched to propane and instantly had a, an engine that we could readily come out and start it and get it to run and then start working on making the engine run better. We probably have the tooling now to be able to start production on the Howe yeah. car, but I don't think that we can compete yeah. with Musk or anybody like that. Uh, no, I don't think we're a threat to any. No, probably not. Even Howe, who later purchased several automobiles, knew that his original design probably wasn't right for the market. Even though I think he was a fairly wealthy person for that time period, I think he also was smart enough to realize after he'd done it I don't have the money or the, the stomach for this. And uh, a lot of people tried and went bankrupt and didn't do as well as he did. Maybe his wife just wanted the space back in the garage, uh, well, too. Well, yeah, yeah. That, that too, yeah. The original Howe car is stored at IU's Mathers Museum. And though it is not on display, there are other exhibits to explore. Learn more at indiana.edu. Now, from preserving history to making sure history doesn't repeat, almost a century ago, Notre Dame made national headlines when it took on the Ku Klux Klan in a battle for their community. During a dark chapter in Indiana history, the Ku Klux Klan, a group originally formed in the South just after the Civil War, 
experienced a resurgence during the 1920s, especially in Indiana. Klan leaders used their newfound political power to intimidate a large group of Hoosiers they considered outsiders, not only African Americans, but also Catholics, Jews, and immigrant populations across the nation. This 20th century iteration of the Klan uh, very much um, focused on the perceptions of Americanism, uh, primarily being white uh, and native born. In the spring of 1924, the group chose to hold a rally in South Bend, where the state's largest Catholic population could be found, at the University of Notre Dame. There were a lot of Catholics in South Bend. So if you're going to provoke something, you might as well do it to the belly of the beast. Father Matthew Walsh, president of Notre Dame, asked city leaders to deny a Klan request to parade through campus in May 1924, fearing for the safety of his students and South Bend citizens. The city's mayor and chief of police agreed with Walsh and denied the KKK a permit to stage a parade through the largely Catholic area. You have these nativists running around talking about uh, loyalties of Catholics. Would they be loyalty, loyal to nation or to church? Um, and this whole notion that somehow the Catholic church is particularly insidious because of this, um, this sense that the Pope uh, commands a loyalty greater than citizenship. Despite direct orders from local officials, a group of more than 2,000 robed Klansmen staged a rally in South Bend on May 17, 1924. As KKK leaders began to gather near the main business district, they shouted and threatened many Notre Dame students who lived nearby in downtown apartments. When word got back to campus that the Klan was threatening young people in town, Hundreds of Notre Dame students on campus ran to the downtown area to help their friends. When they had the rally anyway, when, this, when the Klan decided to have the rally, Notre Dame students confronted them and they did battle with them. Both sides at that point were crying for an altercation. Tensions grew on both sides. Klansmen pulled guns and began firing into the air. Students grabbed pieces of wood from a nearby construction site and began to swing them in self-defense. There's this tension that emerges that in fact taps into these deep-seated kind of anti-immigrant or concerns about um, um, foreign, foreignness and foreign culture penetrating um, uh, American society. University President Matthew Walsh was a veteran of World War I and was certainly no stranger to bloody skirmishes. Throughout the melee, he ran into the screaming crowds, pulling one Notre Dame student after another out of the fray. With Walsh's help, hundreds were soon directed out of harm's way. He eventually led the students on a quiet march back to campus, praying aloud and singing hymns of peace and unity. In all, Eight arrests were made in downtown South Bend that day. Most were Klansmen who instigated much of the fighting and threats of street violence. A KKK newsletter attempted to justify the group's actions by claiming that the students had attacked and maimed hundreds of innocent women and children. Dozens of other reporters who witnessed the incident, however, had a different story to tell. In the midst of the Klan's power grab, a group of students at the University of Notre Dame chose to stand their ground, fight back, and then, under Walsh's guidance, lead a peaceful protest back to campus. Less than two years later, the Klan was crumbling in Indiana. By 1926, many of its leaders faced long prison sentences for various state and federal crimes. One year later, in 1927, the University of Notre Dame was recognized as the nation's leading Catholic institution of higher learning, a reputation they maintain to this day, a reputation partially forged on the chaotic streets of South Bend in the spring of 1924. 
They could take a blow against these Catholic students, and they could take a blow against Irish Catholics as a foreign immigrant population that this university is supposed to be reaching out to. It's a perfect storm. And they could, they could take one big blow and have a big rally and show that the, the true citizens of Indiana were on their side. But they were proven wrong. Loyola Press has published a book titled Notre Dame versus the Klan, which explores this historical event in depth. Check it out at LoyolaPress.com. Well, up next in our Memory Chain series, we use the opportunity to take a snapshot of history and learn about those captured in its print. In the early 20th century, much of the American Midwest was still rural and remote. Same faces, same places. But then, for a few days every summer, a magical encounter with all that lay beyond the horizon. Crowds would gather in early morning to see them arrive. The strangest of strangers who could absolutely amaze you just by standing there. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the Gentry Brothers Circus. Nilgos, cassowaries, owdads, where in the world did all of these animals come from? How did those acrobats ever learn to do that? Questions that back then obscured the deeper ones we can wonder about now. Like, what in the world ever led you to do this? And now that it's all over, what did you wind up doing with your life? But illusion is all they'll ever share with us. The date and location of this photograph, along with the answers to our questions, remain unknown. Look closely. There seems to be the tiniest smile. Ninety years on, we're telling you the same thing we said to everyone who saw us back then. Just use your imagination, because we will never let you know. Like the circus, our next guests hope their music inspires imagination and exploration. All four of us went to high school together. We were best friends first, and then we just decided that music was what we wanted to do together, which is, I feel like is different for a lot of bands. I didn't know anything about the industry when we first started, so I took to the internet like most people do when they don't know what they're doing. I learned a lot about booking and marketing and business and just running a band. I knew I wanted to play music and I knew that I was going to have to do it on my own and that no one else was going to do it for me. So I had to learn as quickly as I could because I knew that high school was over and my plan was to do music. So I had to look at any direction I could to learn. We all have separate roles in the band. I like to do all of our like social media and our marketing and I talk with our manager about like our business plans and I try to be the best leader that I can. Garrett, our guitar player, is the band dad. He runs all of our finances, he does a lot of video work and then he is our mechanic. So he takes care of our old van Sean is like our production guy. He went to school for doing music production. So whatever happens on stage, the lights and the sound and everything that's set up that day, that's Sean's thing. So Noah is more of a morale fella. He doesn't let us take ourselves too seriously. He's jumping around, he's everyone's little brother. He runs our merch as well. It's really been nice to be able to take the responsibility and turn it into four gaps where we can all do what we're best at. 
When people ask me what kind of band I'm in, I usually say I'm in like a loud rock and roll band. Guitars, drums, bass, singing. We definitely have taken our favorite stuff and mashed it together. Songwriting is something that I really have fallen in love with the older that I've gotten. I usually try to hash out as many ideas as I can and I'll have like the bass and the bones of a song and I'll bring it to the rest of the guys and be like, all right, let's make this a stay outside song. Usually when I'm writing, I'm not in the best of moods. Writing in general is the most cathartic thing on earth. I've always had a hard time with expressing myself to other people if I, if I feel a certain way. Writing it down and being able to put it to a melody feels so good. And then usually I can get over what I was feeling and sometimes I'll be like, oh, I didn't even realize I thought this way or I felt this way. And now it's on the paper and I can talk about it every night. When we play live, I really try to like dig into why did I write this song? What does this mean to me? What do these words mean? Because if I'm expressing myself and what those songs mean, then other people will connect to it better. We believe in every song that we write and we want to be able to express that to as many people as we can because we think we have something to say. I definitely want to take appreciation to every show we get to play. Not everybody gets to travel around with their best friends and play music in front of a bunch of people, so I like to appreciate it while it's happening. And now, stay outside. Such a vicious crime. I am Peter, I will deny. I'll keep quiet to stay alive. I'm the only son of a pastor's wife. We all death in our fingertips. Sunk in all of our battleships. Hold my foot out till you go trip. I'm the only words you never meant. I swore you never had
For information on their latest musical release, visit their website, WeStayOutside.com. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. Once more before we go, stay outside. Good night. Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. The Al Cobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Al Cobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. <laughs>